What do you do when God closes the door on something good that you had in your heart to do for Him? You had a great idea, and good and godly people gave you encouragement to press forward with it. You felt sure, now if I do this, this will really be for the glory of God. But very simply, it didn't work out. And as if that was not bad enough, Uh, someone else is doing exactly what you hoped you might do, and it's a little difficult for you when you see that God is blessing them with such great success. Or you train for a particular career, but after all that you have invested in this preparation and in this training, for some reason that you cannot explain, the door simply does not open up for you. You you have asked God to open the way, and it remains a mystery. For some reason, the door to what you thought was your path uh, turns out to be closed. As years pass, it may be some of the experience of looking back wistfully on what might have been. There were certain aspirations in earlier years that were in your heart, but as time goes on, they seem to be getting further away. And you wonder, why did God close the door on good things that were in my heart? You wanted to marry. You wanted to have children. You wanted to reach a certain place in your career. You wanted to gain a place on a particular team, perhaps, or to succeed in some particular area or sphere of ministry. And and the hard thing is that God has given this blessing to others. Why did He not give that blessing to you? Now, we're looking today, then, at one of the toughest challenges that a Christian can face. When God closes the door on something good that you really wanted to do that would glorify Him. Now, we take up the story at 2 Samuel in chapter 7 and verse 1, and you'll notice there that when the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies. In other words, we're beginning with a statement here of the blessing that God has poured into David's life. And uh, more than that, he's been given rest from his enemies, we're told. Now, notice carefully here, and this is important, the enemies had not gone away. They were still surrounding, notice that word, the surrounding enemies. If you look forward to 2 Samuel chapter 8 and then 2 Samuel chapter 10, you will see that there were many, many more battles that David still had to fight in the future. And further into the future, of course, there were further great troubles that arose because of the rebellion of his own son Absalom. But at this point, it seems that there was at least a respite from the activity of these enemies, a breather that gave him some relief. And as soon as that happened, as soon as there was some breaking in the clouds of all this conflict that he had had to engage in to protect the people of God, he says, well, now, now's the time when I can really do something useful for God. God has done so much for me, and now here's a little window. Here's a place where I can now launch out and embark on something significant for him. So, here we have this story then of this good man with a good heart who wants to build a temple for God, but God says no. And that privilege is then given to his son, Solomon. Now, the obvious question is, why did God say no? And it's a real question when God says no to something good that you want to do. Why did God say no? Why would God close a door for David that a generation later he opened for someone else? We don't find it easy to live with the mystery of God's providence. So, of course, we always look for an explanation. And I've been fascinating reading books this week as to all the possible explanations that are suggested by various writers as to why God said no to David building the temple. You know, perhaps David did something wrong. 
Perhaps pride was really the problem. You know, putting up this big building was going to go to his head, and that was what God was doing. Perhaps David was presumptuous. I mean, God had not commanded that a building should be put up by David. But nothing of that sort is actually stated in the Bible. This is important because when something good is on your heart and the door closes, you may very well find, well, it must be that I've done something wrong. That may be your first instinct. And you may feel that God somehow has it in for you, that He doesn't love you after all, that He's closed the door on something good that you wanted to offer to Him. Now, I want you to see, and I do believe that this is important, that David's heart here was indeed good. Um, He had the right concern, he had the right goal, he had the right motive, and he had the right process. Let's just walk through that in the story. First, the right concern. Verse 2, the king said to Nathan the prophet, see now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. Now, I want to suggest to you that was exactly a right concern. I mean, here is David, and he is living a very comfortable life a house of cedar. And he looks at how much he has spent on his own comfort, and then he looks at what he has given to and the disproportion is huge. And he says to himself, in effect, here I am, and I've been investing with all of these resources that God has given to me. I've been investing a very great deal in myself and in my own comfort. It is time that I use the resources that God has given to me to invest in the work of God. That's what's going on in his mind and in his heart. And the process that David goes through of comparing his own life situation with the needs of the work of God in the world that are yet to be done is exactly right. Second, he had the right goal. Now, of course, there are those who are looking for something that David did wrong, and and it's very easy then for them to say, well, you see, putting uh, up a great temple building, that wouldn't be a good investment for David uh, to make of his money. That's not something that God wanted to happen, and so forth and so on. After all, does it not say in the New Testament, God does not live in a house made with human hands? But then we're left with this fact that God gave Solomon that privilege. And when the temple was built, the glory of God's presence actually came down and filled it. So, when God says in verse 5 to Nathan, go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build a house, uh, build me a house to dwell in, the emphasis is very much on the word you. The point is not that God is saying a temple should never be built. It was the purpose of God that it should be built, only it would be built by someone else. It's not going to be you, David. Third, David had the right heart. Uh, Again, there are those who suggest that there must have been something wrong with David's motive. Maybe he wanted the temple to have his name on it and all this kind of thing. Maybe he was uh, under the pretense of saying that he was doing it all for God, really actually trying to promote himself and so forth and so on. But that cannot be the case for this very simple reason, that God actually commends David for having this desire. 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 18. But the Lord said to David, my father, so this is now Solomon speaking, but he's reporting what God said to David. Whereas it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. We know that verse that says God, that man looks on the outward appearance but God looks on the heart. And when God looked on David's heart in regards to his desire to honor the Lord in building this temple, what God saw was something very good, and he said, you did well to have that in your heart. So, this was the right concern. It was the right goal. 
it was the right heart, and even he went about it in the right way. He had the right process. He doesn't just charge on. He goes and gets wise counsel. Uh, the king said to Nathan, the prophet, now see, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. So, David did the right thing. He has an idea about what he should do. He goes and defines and seeks wise counsel. And what better counsel could he get than the uh, counsel of Nathan uh, the prophet, a man who walked with God as David walked with God? And he tells Nathan his concern. He points out what he sees. And Nathan says, go and do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. So here's the wisest counselor he could hope to find, and the wise counselor says to him, David, that's exactly the right thing. Go do it. Go do it. And then on the same night, no doubt to Nathan's complete and utter astonishment, God speaks, and God says no. And the door closes on something good that the king had in his heart to offer to God. Now, friends, I am so glad that this story is in the Bible, because I think that we all, somewhere along the line, live with the mystery of why something good that we really wanted to offer to the Lord did not come to pass. What was that all about? It speaks to all the times in your life and in mine where God closes the door on something good, and, and you say, why did that door not open? What was God doing? Why was David not allowed to do what Solomon was? Why did God give the blessing, the opportunity, and the work that you would have loved to do? And he gave it to someone else. We're not told. I guess this goes under the marvelous statement in Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29 that the secret things belong to the Lord, and we often find ourselves, and especially in these situations, staring into the mystery of the will and the purpose of God. What we do know very, very clearly is that God had a different plan for David. It was not the plan he thought, it wasn't the plan he wanted, but God had a different plan for David. When what you would really like to do turns out not to be God's plan for you. Two things from this story that we learn with regards to that situation. The first is when God says no, your faith is going to be tested. And the second is when God says no, his promise stands secure. We'll look at the first here today. When God says no, when something that's in your heart proves not to be the door that he opens for you, your faith is going to be tested. And it will be tested in three ways. The first is you'll be tested with this question, how well do you really love God? Now, clearly, the very first calling on all of our lives as Christian believers is to love God with all of our heart and with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. Love God. That's the first calling and the first claim that God places upon our lives. Now, if it is really true that you want to do something for God your love for him will be the same whether you get to do it or not. If it's really for God, your love for him will be the same whether you get to do it or not. And therefore, when God says no, your love for him will immediately be tested. It will be shown for what it isn't or for what it is. And David is the most marvelous example here. We'll see this as we follow through the story of this chapter. He really does love God. And so when it becomes clear that what God wants from him is something different from what he originally thought he would most like to offer, he accepts this. Lord, you choose what I will give to you. I wanted to build a temple for your glory. I really did. But if you want something different from me, then I'm ready to give to you whatever you ask. 
Maybe what you can offer where you are in life right now is not what you hoped you would be able to offer to God. But you know, if you really love Him, then you will have a gladness and you will have a peace in offering into His hand whatever it is that He asks of you. David did not get the blessing of building the temple, but God had something else for him to do. And even though it was not what David wanted, it was the best thing that David could offer to God. What to you may be a great disappointment in your life may actually open the way for something greater that God is calling you to do. But we dare not hold on to, I want to do this for you, O Lord, when he's saying to you, well, I actually want you to give me something else. Second, when God says no, your faith will be tested not only because it will be evident how much you really love God, but secondly, your faith will be tested and you'll be asked, how well do you really love others? Now, the second calling of God upon your life, according to Jesus. Uh, you love God with all of your heart. That's the first. And here's the second. You love your neighbor as yourself. You love your brother, your sister. You love the person next to you as much as you love yourself. Now, what does that mean? That would mean that you would have as much joy in God blessing your friend, your sister, your brother, as you would have if God gave the same gift to you. Well, you see, we're going to be tested when God says no, and when we experience disappointments in our lives, when the door closes on something that you wanted to do for Him, uh, you're tested in regards to your love of God. You're tested in regards to how much you love others. And then we're tested in a third way, and it's this, how well do you understand grace? See, grace, of course, is all about what God does for us. It's about what He has done. It's about what He does for us now and it's about what He will do for us in Jesus Christ. Grace means that all of God's kindness and all of His gifts are given to us freely. It means that God's blessing is not earned. It's not a response to what we've done. It's not a reward for the investment that we have made or the degree to which we have extended ourselves. And it's very fascinating to me that these verses that begin with what David wants to do for God end up simply overflowing with what God does for David. Notice what God has done in the past. Verse 8, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. Just in case David should ever doubt the love of God in the light of this door that was closing for him, God says, David, remember this. You were a shepherd somewhere out in these hills, and I laid my hand on you, and I brought you into the position of favor that you now enjoy joy. And think about how that relates to you, Christian brother, Christian sister. Here you are in Jesus Christ for time and for eternity. You are a son and a daughter of God when millions are still outside. And why are you in? Why are you in Christ? You did nothing to deserve this. This is God's grace, and it has been lavished upon you. And then look at what God was doing for David right there and then, verse 9. And I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. In other words, God's saying, don't forget this, David. If you are disappointed at the door that is closing, I am with you every step of the journey of your life. I never leave you. I never forsake you. Christian brother and sister, that is the promise of God to us. And God sticks with you and God sticks with me even when we're at our worst. That's grace. And that's ours in the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever doors close in your life, that's God's grace to you. And then what about the future? Verse 9, and I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones on the earth. In other words, David, what you are, 
and what your life will turn out to be. You can trust that into my hand. You don't need to fret about a particular opportunity that didn't open for you. You can trust me with the outcome of who you are and what your life ultimately will be. That's grace. And in Jesus Christ, who you are and the outcome of your life is safe in the hand of God for time and for eternity. You know, taking a good look at grace takes the sting out of disappointment. It really does. David, you are in the very center of my grace. Don't you worry about a door that closed that you hoped would open. David, make sure that your joy isn't lying in what you get to do for me. Make sure, David, that your joy ultimately lies in what I am doing and will do for you. Otherwise, you will be distraught when disappointment comes and when he closes a door that you thought he would open. And Lloyd-Jones says this to Ian Murray. The greatest danger, he said, is to live on activity, to live on activity. And he said, the ultimate test of a preacher is what he feels when he cannot preach. Well, translate that. I mean, that's not just for preachers, right? The ultimate test of a teacher, what are you going to do when you can't teach? Fill in your career, fill in whatever. The ultimate test of all of us is when we cannot do what we love to do. Where are we then? And then Lloyd-Jones quoted these words from the verse I've just repeated for you, the words of Jesus. Do not rejoice that the spirits are subject to you. You find your joy in this, that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Don't set your joy in what you get to do but in what he, the Lord and the Savior, has done for you. And you know what? When you know what it cost the Savior for your name to be written in that book of life, for your sins to be forgiven, for your eternal future to be secured, you will find such great joy in what he has done for you that that joy will be yours, irrespective of what you may or may not get to do for him. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, please help us to love you whether you open or close the door to what we want to do. Help us so to love others that we will find joy in your gifts to them, even when these gifts are not given to us. And teach us to value your grace so that we find our joy not in what we are doing for you, but in what you have done and are doing and are yet to do for us through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose wonderful name we pray and everyone together said.